Pradik stability. To enlighten us on this theme, four eminent defense and strategic studies practitioners and experts have accepted our invitation as guest speakers. To navigate this most important session of KDU International Research Conference 2022, we have here with us Major General Amal Kamnasegar, RWP, RSP, VSV, USP, NDC, PSC, Commandant National Defence College, Sri Lanka, the Chair. Major General Amal Kamnasegar, RWP, RSP, VSV, USP, NDU, PSC, MSC, was commissioned to the 1st Battalion, Sri Lanka, Light Infantry on 14th January 1984. Later, he successfully followed numerous local and overseas courses in various fields of studies to uplift his knowledge and continuous professional advancement. His overseas training includes Army Command and Staff College, India, Civil Military Response Terrorism in the United States of America, International Intelligence Directors course in UK, and Defence and Strategic Studies course in National Defence University, China. Being a professional military officer with an excellent record of conduct and an outstanding career in various capacities in command, instructional and administration, among those worth mentioning are Battalion Commander, Brigade Commander, Director Training, Director of Military Intelligence, Divisional Commander, Security Force Commander, Military Secretary, Master General Ordnance, Directing Staff at Army Command and Staff College, Commandant Defence Services and Staff College, and Chief of Staff of Sri Lanka Army. At which appointment, ladies and gentlemen, he retired and was recalled for active service and appointed as the Commandant National Defence College. He has the honour of being the commander of the first ever Sri Lankan contingent of troops for the United Nations peacekeeping operations that was sent to Haiti in 2004. Major General Amal Karunayasekar completed his master's degree in defense and strategic studies from the University of Madras, India. He also completed the master of science degree in defense management from General Sergeant Kotalawal Defense University, Sri Lanka. Thereafter, he obtained another MSc on Defence and Strategic Studies from the University of Beijing, China. He was awarded the Rana Vikrama Padakkama and Rana Shura Padakkama for gallantry. He is also a recipient of Vishistha Seva Vibhushanaya, Medal for Exceptional, Distinguished and Loyal Service and Uttama Seva Padakkama for his unblemished military career in the Army. Major Amar Karuna Sekar is married to Dananjani and is blessed with one daughter who is studying at General Surgeon Kotalar Defence University. While thanking him for being here with us today, accepting our invitation, I now cordially invite Major Lamar Karuna Sekar, RWP, RSP, VSV, USP, NDU, PSC, MSC on the stage and chair the Defence Plenary Session 1. Meantime, I would like to call upon our eminent guest speakers, some online, some physically, in this plenary. Dr. Arinadan, Indo-Pacific Coordinator, United States Embassy in Sri Lanka. Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, Director General of National Maritime Foundation, India. He is joining us physically. Vice Admiral Professor Dr. Ayar Amarulla Octavian, MSc, DESD, ASEAN, Engineer, Chancellor of the Defence University of Republic of Indonesia. Professor Mohammed Misan bin Mohammed Aslam, Professor of Defence, Security and Strategic Studies in National Defence University of Malaysia. Major Amar Karunan Sekhar will also introduce the speakers of the Defence Plenary Session 1 to the audience. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Upali, for kind introduction. Vice Chancellor, Kotalara Defence University, Excellencies, Senior Professors, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. First of all, allow me to thank 
the organizers of KDU IRC 2022 for entrusting me with the responsibility to chair this plenary session of KDU IRC 2022, which is themed on a very vital concept at a time when our world is recovering from a crucial pandemic with economic revivals while seeing advancement of technology and innovation on the other side. This is the third year that KDU is holding this major annual event in hybrid format out of its 15 very successful conferences. But this year, I am speaking to you in much more positive context in terms of the health situation, political stability, and economic outlook in the country. I am sure that a positive stance was well highlighted by the keynote speaker and the uh, other speakers as well. <clears throat> the theme for this session is national security through strategic stability. And we have four eminent speakers representing regional and extra-regional context to talk on this much controversial but interesting subject. Essentially, strategic stability has become even more complex with multiple regional players entering picture with their diverse visions on what constitutes stability or instability. Now the world <clears throat> is so much changed, so much more complicated, so unpredictable and multivariate, involving so many nations and cultures and languages in nuclear relationships, many of them asymmetric, that is even difficult to know how many meanings there are for strategic stability or how many different kinds of such stability there may be among so many different international relationships. The current dynamic environment suggests that the complex factors of security should be understood much more broadly than just involving the military. Therefore, national security issues have many peculiarities that need to be taken into account when analyzing the implementation of sustainable development goals related to economic, social and environmental issues. Under this framework, it is crucial to recognize that although the world is confronting common crises, there are differences within and between countries. Hence, knowledge systems should be constructed broadly to include the diverse historical, cultural, social and institutional features of countries. So I am certain that this will be a good platform to share those intellectual thoughts locally regionally as well as globally to have a common understanding to identify possible solutions. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank our distinguished speakers for giving their time and insight today and I hope this will be an eye-opener and will benefit and enjoy the conference as well. Thank you. <clears throat> With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the first speaker of this session, Dr. Ari Nathan. Dr. Ari Nathan is currently a Foreign Service Officer with the United States Government. Dr. Nathan has worked on four continents over the past 10 years, working on a range of issues such as securing renewable energy in Spain, civil society in Colombia, and economic development in Iraq. Dr. Ari Nathan obtained his PhD from the Fletcher School and worked briefly at the United Nations. Dr. Ari Nathan currently working as the Indo-Pacific Coordinator for South Asia, U.S. Embassy in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Dr. Be, um, oh. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I am deeply honored to be here amongst such a distinguished group and to be part of such an important discussion. I'm very much appreciative of KDU's outstanding hospitality and uh, foresight and wisdom in choosing this topic for our discussion. As mentioned, I work at the U.S. Embassy on regional Indo-Pacific issues, but my remarks are more on my personal perspective. They're not um, official USG policies, um, and they're, they're off the record. So first of all, the question is, um, in discussing uh, the United States Indo-Pacific strategy, which I'm going to do, the first question is, what do we mean by the Indo-Pacific? And um, 
What we say is it stretches from the west coast of the United States to the west coast of India and everything in between, or as we sometimes put it, from Hollywood to Bollywood. So clearly, Sri Lanka is right there in that mix. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks really, though, on what is the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and how it ties in with a vision that we share with many other countries um, in the region, including Sri Lanka. But first, the question is, why does the Indo-Pacific matter? And I think the answer is pretty clear. The Indo-Pacific matters because much of the planet's future will be based on what happens here in this region. The Indo-Pacific is home to more than half the world's population, importantly, including almost 60% of the world's youth. It's home to nearly two-thirds of the world's economy, and importantly, seven of the world's largest militaries. As a country with deep ties throughout the Indo-Pacific, and as a proud Indo-Pacific nation ourselves, what happens in the Indo-Pacific matters a great deal to the United States. If you just look at it from a monetary or economic perspective, the U.S. is the largest source of foreign direct investment in the Indo-Pacific, and the largest donor of foreign assistance with more than $2 trillion since World War II in foreign assistance. In 2020, for example, the U.S. conducted $1.75 trillion in two-way trade with the Indo-Pacific region, which supported more than 5 million jobs across the region. The U.S. approach to the Indo-Pacific is guided by our Indo-Pacific strategy, or as we call it sometimes, the IPS. President Biden explained it this way, quote, American interests can only be advanced if we firmly anchor the United States in the Indo-Pacific and strengthen the region itself alongside our closest allies and partners, end quote. So the Indo-Pacific strategy, or the IPS, is built upon decades and decades of partnerships across the region. At its core, the IPS is a vision for a region which remains free and open, becomes ever more resilient, prosperous, secure, and interconnected. Those are the five pillars of our Indo-Pacific strategy. And as you might note, they very much align with the conference theme focused on economic revival, sustainability, and security. The United States is committed to long-term work with our allies and our partners to make this shared vision a reality. Yeah, the, the IPS, I should be clear, it is not a military or security alliance, but it does include sometimes taking a hard look at behavior by countries that could undermine these shared values that we all have. As I noted, I believe that this vision that is articulated in the IPS is shared by other countries in the region, including Sri Lanka. And that's because, as Indo-Pacific nations, we share common interests, and we've worked together to advance these interests. So let me briefly expand on these five core elements of the IPS, and then I'll take a look at how they more closely are shared in the region and specifically with Sri Lanka. The first one is free and open. What this is about is advancing a free and open Indo-Pacific in which problems are dealt with openly, rules reached transparently and applied fairly, goods and ideas and people can flow freely across land, cyberspace, and open seas, with governance that's, governance that's transparent and responsive to the people. And that's the first core element. The second is interconnected. That's about forging stronger connections within and beyond the region to ensure that we work together as a regional community to tackle our shared problems. The third core element is prosperous. And this is based on promoting broad-based prosperity so that no country gets left behind in the 21st century. U.S. companies and investors have directed trillions of dollars in foreign direct investment into the Indo-Pacific, and will meet the call for the region to do more. Next is security. So the U.S., through its Indo-Pacific strategy, looks to bolster security in the region by leaning on our greatest strength, which is our alliances and our partnerships. Security means the movements of peoples, ideas, and goods across international sea, land, and air borders, and across cyberspace, 
and ensuring that these are done legally and in accordance with international maritime, civil aviation, and cross-border rules. Finally, the fifth core element is resiliency. So we focused largely on two aspects here, um, the COVID pandemic and building resiliency to that. Uh, globally, the United States has provided over 400 million doses of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines, hundreds of millions of dollars in additional assistance to save lives. Um, we continue to provide this type of aid, no strings attached, because by ending the pandemic and building back better, we help all of us. Um, another important element, and as was touched upon by our keynote speaker, is climate change. So the United States has mobilized billions of dollars in clean energy, clean air, and climate resilience projects throughout the region, looking to provide clean, green jobs, both in the United States and throughout the Indo-Pacific. President Biden has pledged to quadruple U.S. climate assistance by 2024. So let me try to take some of these sort of broad concepts and talk about how they apply specifically to our shared vision with Sri Lanka. Now first, as we all know here in this room, Sri Lanka has a key geostrategic location. It's next to shipping lanes that are vital for global economic health. This means Sri Lanka really can have a key leadership role in the Indo-Pacific, and it should take real pride in the ability to have that role and in exercising that. Now, how does the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific tie into that? Well, let me just elaborate a little bit. Our, our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, described freedom this way, quote, freedom is about the ability to write your future and have a say in what happens in your community and your country, no matter who you are or who you know, end quote. And that means ensuring that goods can flow freely across open seas, which is especially critical for Sri Lanka because you're next to some of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Half the world's container ships, about two thirds of the world's oil shipments, these all pass right next to Sri Lanka. And for Sri Lanka to leverage its position for its interest in, in, in ports and, and shipbuilding, it means that you need to have open seas and freedom of navigation for all ships. So that's why I say that it's in the interests of both the United States and Sri Lanka to ensure that we have an Indo-Pacific that's free and open. The second area I mentioned was interconnectedness. This is about forging connections, uh, strengthening connections, building new connections that contribute to our shared Indo-Pacific vision. Our individual and our collective security, which includes economic security, as was articulated again by our keynote speaker, will largely depend on the connections that we maintain and build. None of us can do this alone. This can clearly be seen when we look at supply chains in the region, right? We all saw what happened to supply chains in the last couple of years. And it's one of the reasons why we're looking to advance resilient and secure supply chains and remove barriers to supply chains and improve transparency in those supply chains. In June, the Biden administration and G7 leaders announced the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, which included a U.S. pledge of $200 billion over the next five years to the partnership. Another example that is literally, as well as figuratively, about connections was the um, commitment we made to the, uh, the U.S. telecommunications company Subcom, which received $4 million in grants to extend the reach of its 10,000 plus mile undersea submarine cable that goes from Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Singapore, Horn of Africa, and has connections to India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to help ensure that these connections are stronger and more secure in every way we can. And we're not just talking about the private sector. Um, I, I noted that our keynote speaker mentioned the importance of human capital. And we are Do very proud. Excuse, doctor, you have two minutes more. Two minutes. We're very proud of our 60-year relationship um, with the people <coughs> of Sri Lanka, where we've uh, contributed to helping develop human capital. Um, we have uh, are celebrating our 70th anniversary of our U.S. Sri Lanka Fulbright program. Where over a thousand researchers, professors, and students have traveled between our countries. Prosperous is another key element. 
Our two nations are key economic partners, with the United States being Sri Lanka's largest single export market annually, um, counting for nearly $2.8 billion of Sri Lanka's exports. And this number grew even during um, COVID. The Development Finance Corporation is increasing, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation is increasing its exposure here in Sri Lanka, which went from $20 million to nearly $300 million in 2021, especially through loans to private Sri Lankan banks that use the funding for small and medium enterprises with an emphasis on women-owned businesses. For resiliency, we've uh, donated uh, millions of vaccines to Sri Lanka. Um, and provided a lot of uh, economic support as well for uh, COVID resiliency. Uh, climate change, of course, is important. And in the region, uh, we have launched the South Asia Regional Energy Partnership with $49 million for the countries in the region to build climate resiliency. Here in Sri Lanka specifically, USAID has a 19, almost $19 million energy partnership with the government of Sri Lanka to help make the power sector um, greener. So um, another part of resiliency now that we're thinking about is food security, right? And just last month, uh, USAID Administrator Samantha Power announced an additional $40 million in development assistance to help farmers purchase fertilizer. The fifth core aspect of our Indo-Pacific strategy is security. Um, and part of this is protecting that wonderful environment here in Sri Lanka that we have. Um, the environmental sustainability, as was mentioned, is a, is a critical part of um, security. Um, that's why the United States and uh, the Sri Lanka Navy and Sri Lanka Air Force are partners to improve mar maritime domain awareness capabilities of both services and facilitate working together on maritime patrols and interdictions. Um, this has led to large drug busts. It's, it's helped, um, Sri it's supported Sri Lanka in responding to uh, disasters like the MT New Diamond and MV Pearl Express fires. And we're continuing to work together in this area. Uh, to this end, the United States recently transferred a third high endurance cutter to Sri Lanka, which has started its voyage to Sri Lanka, which will be the longest voyage in the history of the Sri Lankan Navy, I understand. So in conclusion, I'll say that our vision for the Indo-Pacific recognizes that the planet's future will be based on what happens here. Um, I've tried to outline a shared vision for the Indo-Pacific and, given, and shared some ideas about what a partnership for a free, open, prosperous, connected, and resilient, and secure Indo-Pacific can achieve. I would like to suggest that it's clear that the United States stands with the Sri Lankan people and that we are committed to working with Sri Lanka to help meet immediate, medium, and long-term needs, as well as to support sustainable economic growth, promote inclusivity, strengthen governance, and foster free and prosperous Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arinathan, for your very thought-provoking presentation. And also, I would like to uh, highlight two key points. He mentioned about the strengthening of Indo-Pacific region with five pillar concepts that USA have adopted. And also, the Sri Lanka can play a vital role in Indo-Pacific region as well. With that, uh, let me move to second speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our Second Speaker, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chawa, the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. Admiral Pradeep Chauhan is a retired Indian Naval officer who had illustrious, rich and varied four decades long career. Apart from being on the visiting faculty of the Higher Command Establishment in India, he has also been advising the government through his interaction with the integrated headquarters of the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of External Affairs, and the National Security Council Secretariat. He is, in addition, a prolific writer with over 95 published professional articles and papers and a respected advisor and fellow of several important think, tank, think tanks. Admiral will join us via online and you may start your presentation now, please. I'm going to support my presentation uh, with uh, some PowerPoint slides, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, let me try and put some context to what we're going to be talking about, because we are going to discuss national security through strategic stability. And I'm going to present you an Indian perspective 
Please bear in mind that there are 1.4 billion Indians and that therefore there are probably 1.4 billion Indian perspectives. So I'm going to present one of them. Um, let me start by saying, uh, by asserting that the manner in which we normally uh, position our planning, our analysis our, and our discussions uh, so as to keep geopolitics, geo uh, strategy and uh, geoeconomics in the same typological plane is simply conceptually incorrect. Uh, the truth, of course, is like Sri Lanka, every other country has a set of geoeconomic goals and a set of non-geoeconomic goals, and then it develops geostrategies to try and attain these geoeconomic goals and other geostrategies to try and attain non-geoeconomic goals. And of course, uh, having evolved these, this geostrategy, uh, it then seeks to place in, uh, put in place a set of assurance and insurance mechanisms uh, which could be brittle uh, and relate only to interpersonal relations between political leaders, or they could be more enduring, in which case they are the instruments of uh, foreign policy, namely diplomacy and the military. And that whole caboodle is then geopolitics, and that's what I wish to talk to you about. Now, the next two centuries from India's perspective will certainly be centuries of the seas. And as a result, over the course of these two centuries, India will either be a maritime power or she will not be any kind of power at all. And of course, the ability to use the seas for our own purposes so while dissuading or deterring or preventing others from using them in ways that are to our disadvantage constitutes any country's maritime power, and that is no different from India either. And maritime power is, of course, as everybody knows, the military political and economic power exerted through the ability to use the seas. Let me contextualize this all very quickly to India. The desired end state for India is clearly uh, the economic, the material and the societal well-being of the people of India. And for the people of India, I dare say you could substitute uh, Sri Lanka or any other people. Uh, barring some autocratic regimes in which regime survival is so important because the people of that state have been conflated with the regime of that particular state. That having been said, we come to the enunciation of uh, a statement of policy, which is uh, really the enunciation of uh, the desired end state. And for India, uh, our statement of maritime policy is encapsulated by the acronym SAGA, which everybody is familiar with, meaning standing for security and growth for all in the region. And this is the diagrammatic depiction of Sagar. It is India's dime. It is our diplomatic, our informational, our material, and our, society, and our economic outreach throughout the region. Naturally, uh, we are guided in terms of policy, in terms of maritime policy, by a conceptual framework which is now on your screen. And therefore, this, this indicates two basic pillars. One is the blue economy, or otherwise known as holistic maritime security involving all the features that you see on the left extremity of the diagram and the other is maritime hard security. Both these must rest upon a legal framework in which national or municipal law is fully reconciled with duly ratified international law and only then can there be a proper integration of maritime stakeholder activities. Now this legal framework of reconciliation between national law and duly ratified international law is the weakest element of almost any nation in the, in, in the Indian Ocean region uh, in particular. Could I request uh, the tech team to please mute themselves? There's a lot of voice uh, overlay. Thank you. Uh, from there, we move down to India's uh, principal maritime interest, which I've already said is represented by holistic maritime security that is freedom arising, uh, freedom from threats arising in the sea or through the sea or from the sea. And these threats could be man-made, they could be natural, they could be combinations, they could be traditional ones, non-traditional ones, uh, and, and you're familiar with all of these. I don't need to belabor any of them here. That then brings us to the geographical context, uh, which was uh, alluded to earlier. And as far as India is concerned, uh, our geographical concept of the Indo-Pacific uh, extends farther than that of the United States, and it goes from the shore of East Africa all the way to the shores of the American continents, north and south. And then that 
indicates that the Indo-Pacific for us is a predominantly, but certainly not an exclusively maritime area or expanse. That brings us to the objectives and in the absence of a government white paper on the subject, uh, the NMF uh, derives these uh, objectives and we have eight of them as shown on your screen. Uh, these are the maritime objectives of India, I dare say, ranging from protection or from sea-based threats to India's territorial integrity, which continue apace, regrettably, and therefore prevent India from becoming purely a provider of public goods uh, in the post-modernistic kind of Navy, all the way down to uh, support to marine scientific research, including that in Antarctica and the Arctic, and of course the provision of support, succor, and extrication options to our diaspora, incorporating within that range trade, uh, blue economy issues, and uh, the, the, the management and protection of maritime resources. And then that, those eight objectives obviously lead us to our strategies, and India's grand strategy, India's military strategy, and our maritime strategy are increasingly being contextualized to the Indo-Pacific, because that is then our strategic geography, and that brings us to a new term. And uh, what on earth is this concept of strategic geography, and how does strategic geography differ from real geography? Well, if you simply take a map or a chart, and on it you place a number of latitudes and longitudes, and then you join all of them by a line, and then the area that is encompassed by that line is in that area, you tend to concentrate much of your grand strategy, then the area that is so bounded will become your strategic geography. Now, clearly, the strategic geography of India will not be the same as that of Tonga, and Tonga will not be the same as that of Russia, and Russia will not be the same as that of the United States, and the United States may not be that of Sri Lanka. So the name as a sovereign power that we have given to our strategic geography is, of course, the Indo-Pacific, and the fact that there are other Indo-Pacific constructs is neither more nor less than the fact that there are many John Smiths, and it is nobody's case that every John Smith should be the same as every other John Smith, simply because his name is John Smith. Now, so far as India is concerned, we now have, we must now contend with two Indias of equal size in area. We have a continental India with a land area of 3.2 million square kilometers, and there is going to be a maritime India with a, an area of 3.2 million square kilometers. So India's challenge will always remain, how do we achieve the right balance between our continental or our land-based and our maritime geopolitical imperatives? And now we move from there to India, touching upon India's maritime strategies. Here at the strategic level, uh, in times of peace, our main major thrust line is for constructive engagement. India is currently uh, concentrating on two major but very different approaches for its endeavors vis-a-vis -vis constructive engagement. The first is the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative which was launched in uh, Bangkok on, in 2019 by the East Asia Summit, simply having been articulated uh, as, as a proposal by the Indian Prime Minister. This implies a deeply interconnected web of seven spokes or pillars, as shown on your screen, and this is not some grand Indian plan in which we say, this is how we're going to be doing it, and you can join this, that, or the other. We're, going to, we're just saying that these are really major areas of concern, and they generate stability if they are addressed. And would, does anybody have any ideas? Would anybody like to take the lead? Would anybody like to join us uh, or have us join them? And therefore, these countries have already stepped up to the plate, the ones you can see in red, for the specific pillar or spoke. It should not be thought that the, each of these spokes or pillars is independent of any other. All seven are, as I said, deeply interconnected. The second approach that we're following is, of course, the Quad. There will be uh, talk about that later. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that there are, of course, a number of other strategic constructs in the Indian Ocean which bear upon our own strategies and that of our neighbors. This is a rather complicated looking Venn diagram showing you the many constructs and the dates of their arrival. And therefore, the Indian Ocean, contrary to many uh, Western observers, is not an area which is interconnecting constructs. It is, in fact, quite a busy area, as you can see on the screen. 
Moreover, for us in India, Africa matters more than ever, and I dare say that is true of almost all the countries uh, represented here in this uh, in this plenary. Uh, Africa has a billion people, it has a billion young people, it's a growing populace, it's a growing economic power, and therefore Africa's uh, security architecture constructs are a huge effort is being made by us to make sure that they meld seamlessly into our own. Whether that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Crimario effort by the European Union or the 2050 AIMS strategy of Africa's integrated maritime strategy construct and so on. So now coming to ensuring stability in our maritime neighborhood, I just wanted to emphasize to the audience here that India's proximate maritime neighborhood comprises India's immediate neighborhood, which has those countries with whom India shares a territorial sea boundary and those countries with whom India shares a boundary, but not necessarily a territorial sea one, but uh, an exclusive economic zone or an extended continental shelf one, plus 21 countries of this particular region, which diagrammatically looks like this. And this is India's proximate neighborhood. Right. That brings us to the regional uh, stability imperative, and we are great believers in Zoltan Merce's comment that money is a coward. Money does not go where there is turbulence and risk, and since we do need money, we are conscious of the fact that Tanzania, for example, uh, loses 0.7% of its GDP for every, every year for each neighbor which is in conflict, not necessarily uh, uh, Tanzania itself, and the same applies to India. So we are driven, therefore, to try and support poverty reduction, to try and promote the, the, the uh, uh, SDG goals relating to uh, poverty and hunger, and making sure, therefore, that India supports, India promotes, India provides for regional maritime stability. So what should we do? Uh, people ask us, have you got any resources? And we say, yeah, we do, but uh, what should we do? Should we remember to cut our coat according to our cloth as our teachers have taught us? Or should we weave our cloth according to the coat that we want? And they say that's a very clever turn of phrase, but do you still have, you still need resources? And do you have resources? And the answer there lies in audiences such as this one and universities such as the KDU, being able to distinguish between the word capacity and the word capability. Capacity is material wherewithal. Countries which have excess capacity throw capacity at a problem. We'll give you more port, more aircraft, more submarine, more. But that's all capacity. You don't have a patrol boat, I give you a patrol boat, I have doubled your capacity. Capability, on the other hand, is human ability to actually uh, maximize the capacity which has been given. So you didn't have a patrol boat, I gave you a patrol boat, but do you know how to uh, deploy it? Do you know how to work a uh, operating income life cycle costing for it? Do you have a operating income refit cycle? Do you have a legal infrastructure? Do you have a training framework? Yes, 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 yes. Wow, you have capability. No, 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 and no. I'm afraid you only have a liability. And Ex therefore, excuse me, we in the Indian Ocean area, we may not have too much spare capacity, but we certainly have more than adequate capability. And I therefore, you, we, all of us, we must play to our respective strengths and not simply ape the strengths of others, which might well be weaknesses of our own. Admiral, Finally, uh, you have two minutes, man. Uh, during the troubles that Sri Lanka has been facing in this current year, uh, which have been a follow-up of many issues, COVID not being the least of them, uh, India's uh, assistance to Sri Lanka is not driven by some uh, transactional process. India just recognizes that all boats must rise to the same tide and therefore India cannot have an economy which is sitting on some crest while the economies of its maritime neighborhood are wallowing in some trough. This simply cannot happen. And therefore, for India to progress as India, India recognizes the need for security and growth for all in the region. It is enlightened self-interest, but we recognize that the security and the growth of the region and the economic development of the region is the only way that we ourselves can grow economically. And therefore, all the effort that is made by India in the last several months, the details of which you are aware, it is hardly for me to be uh, required to point out the, de 
the, the specifics. I just wanted to emphasize that whether it is whether it is currency swaps, whether it is soft loans, lines of credit, India has not imposed any conditionalities. India has not said that you can only get this currency swap if you have X number of million dollars in your uh, foreign exchange reserves, nothing of that sort, simply because we recognize that Sri Lanka occupies a particularly central place in the Indian heart. So when we provide for uh, cap capacities in the, uh, in the Sri Lankan uh, uh, hours of need, whether today or earlier, we recognize the fact that we do provide some capacities. We provide for information awareness, maritime domain awareness. We provide for some platforms and some capacities that we can. But the main thing that we provide is capability enhancement. Training. Training is what we do. We don't do this on our own. We don't say hi, you just sit down uh, to do excuse while me. we look after that. I'm finishing, sir. You and have one minute training more. Training is therefore our major effort. Let me finish with this one slide on risk and tell you that like every other country, we are informed by a continuous assessment of risk in our region. We have seven major risks as we see it to stability, one for each day of the week. So how does it finally look insofar as China is concerned? For us, it looks like this. It's quite scary. But is China then plotting to circle India? The answer is an unequivocal no. But is India getting surrounded? The answer, I'm afraid, is a yes. And so we, can, we are concerned with what is happening. We do not consider, this, consider ourselves to be the target of this, but we are certainly part of the collateral. And with that, I will rest my case and seek to have some further input during the Q&A session should it be uh, deemed appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral Chauhan, for your wonderful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me invite our third speaker in this session, Vice Admiral TNI Professor Dr. Amrullah Octavian, the Chancellor of the Defence University of the Republic of Indonesia. Admiral Amrullah is a professor and researcher on maritime security, military sociology and naval strategy. He is also a lecturer for Indonesian Air Force Staff Command and Staff College, Indonesian Joint Staff and Command College, and University of Indonesia. He is author of several articles and books and international journals. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Admiral TNI Professor Amrula Octavian. His presentation will be video recorded. Thank you. Good morning, the Honorable Chancellor of General Sir John Kotelawala, Defense University, our respected colleague and distinguished participant. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver my presentation with title Navy Role in Dealing with Climate Change. The Industrial Revolution marked the beginning of the shift in human civilization and technological advancement, which become one of the cause of climate change. Climate change has taken place following the shift in human civilization from the first to the fourth industrial revolution. The impact of the technological advancement and the industrial revolution has led to rising fuel consumption, particularly for land, sea, and air transportation. The increasing trend of world fuel consumption is quite significant since 1950 until it caused the first world oil crisis in 1973. Discussion and talk on climate change began in the 1930 by Milutin Milankovic, a scientist who discovered mathematics, climatology, and the astronomic theory of climate change that explain change in the ice age. Over the last 150 years, the Earth system has emerged from the very cold temperature of the little ice age period in the North and South Atlantic region. Then global warming began in the 20th century. We gradually felt the effect of global warming when environmental threats such as 
pollution on land, sea, or air, and the effect of the crisis began to emerge. Distinguished participants, the greenhouse effect, forest degradation and loss, ozone layer depletion, agricultural land degradation, water pollution, and decreased fish availability in the sea are just a few effects of the threat caused by environmental damage as the impact of climate change. The extreme climate change due to the greenhouse effect cause an unpredictability and or reduction in the duration of the rainy season. This matter can create serious disaster. Location that firmly never get a large volume of rain will suffer slight soil erosion and flooding when they get more rain than the usual. On the other hand, area that usually get a lot of rain might become drought when the rain intensity is lesser than before. Forest and land fire may also occur when they do not get much rain. The greenhouse effect is a result from deforestation, fossil fuel use, chemical fertilizer use, marine pollution, livestock cultivation, household waste and plastic waste. The impact of the greenhouse effect on national security become a driver of migration from less fertile area to the more fertile area. Thus, conflict become a risk from climate change to human security. The threat of environmental damage can be in the form of pollution, both land, sea, or air pollution. Some of the sea pollution include oil and hazardous substances spilled at sea, air emission, inv invasive species existence, waste disposal, noise interference, and drug or shipwreck disposal into the sea. Extreme weather and natural disaster that occur due to climate change, such as the increase of heat, uh, of heat temperature, forest fire, tsunami, earthquake, and drought took place in various countries and caused human casualties, infrastructure damage, and billion dollars of economic damage. 80% of, of marine pollution come from the land. Air pollution is also a major cause of marine pollution, such as the disposal of pesticides or waste into the sea. Land and air pollution have been proven hazardous to marine life and its habitat. <coughs> Some types of waste are classified as hazardous and toxic waste, which consists of explosive, flammable, reactive, infectious, corrosive, and other waste. Distinguished participant, the Sustainable Development Goal was adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a call for action to end poverty, protect the earth, and ensure that everyone will feel peace and prosperous in 2030. SDG itself discuss how to conserve and utilize the sea and marine resources sustainably by establishing the leave no one principle with a holistic and integralist integralistic approach. Therefore, the Navy role and duty become crucial in contributing as a maritime security strength. The universal role of the Navy is reflected in the Ken Boot theory that Poi posits the trinity of naval function, namely the military function, constabulary function, and diplomatic function of the Navy. Therefore, the universal role of the Navy can be elaborated as follows. First, the military role, which refers to the optimal use of naval force to win a war or armed conflict. Second, the constabulary role to uphold the law at sea. Third, the diplomatic role, or the use of sea power 
as a means of diplomacy in supporting the government foreign policy. The Navy must carry out its role in dealing with the emerging threat caused by climate change. The universal role of the Navy is also to perform operational tasks other than war, including assisting to fight forest fire in remote area, conducting climate change intelligence monitoring and recognition operation, providing remote public health monitoring, supporting civil science projects, overseeing remote public work infrastructure projects, giving advice on national policy, and projecting disaster assistance to regional countries. Climate change does not affect the development process, but also the security sector globally. In this way, the role of the Navy in peacetime could directly contribute to the achievement of the SDG. In the framework of national security strategy, the Navy serves as an instrument of national power to achieve national interest. Three objectives of national interest are related to a vital national goal, namely the achievement of physical security, promotion of value and economic welfare. Then the role of diplomacy for other countries can be defined as naval diplomacy and crisis management. Although the constabulary role is not the same as the police role, it can be replaced or supplemented with law enforcement or law and order at sea. Every country has its own characteristic in positioning its navy in this trinity which depend on the diction of each country political decision. Distinguished participant, in the current and future development, the role of the Navy is directed more on the security of the maritime environment. So there is a need for adoption of the Navy role to deal with the threat of climate change as part of the maritime security power. The new role of the Navy must be able to address environmental changes that might create maritime security problem. The constabulary role can be implemented as a law enforcement role for nature, for nature conservation and the diplomatic role as a role to strengthen environmental care for nature conservation. The new military role of the Navy is a form of environmental care for nature conservation. Some of the new military role of the Navy are to preserve and safeguard maritime border, maintain security and stability in the maritime domain, and prevent maritime threat that may come from water. Operations are conducted to support residents' effort for the community during peacetime. Among them is the management of environment pollution especially in the water. The need to be improved in order to slow the path of climate change and cause less harm and loss to the ecological balance of the local and global ecosystem. The new constabulary role of the Navy is a form of care to the environment through law enforcement for nature conservation. Defense and law enforcement organization have a specific and direct responsibility for maritime security, maritime safety, is both prevention measure and response intended to protect the maritime domain and limit the effect of hazard and accidental or natural damage to the environment, as well as risk or loss. Many organizations are responsible for maritime safety which consists of search and rescue organization, law enforcement or constabulary agency, marine traffic control, fishery, fishery protection, cultural protection, and environmental protection agencies. The new diplomatic role of the Navy are the role of strengthening environmental care in nature conservation. The importance of naval diplomacy has recently increased as a result of high concern of our maritime security and the need to meet the shared maritime security demand. The objective of the maritime diplomacy policy are 
to optimize the existing marine potential and to fulfill the national interest through international law by using strategies to improve countries' leadership in various bilateral, regional, and global maritime cooperation. Naval diplomacy is the use of the naval force as a diplomatic weapon for advancing political and foreign policy purposes. Diplomatic function can begin as positive function, Recording in progress. such as disaster relief or change into a function that involves more coercion. Naval forces can be used to send symbolic messages to government by progressively improving their offensive capabilities. Distinguished participants, Global Marine Trend 2030 discuss the future of the marine sector using a scenario-based approach throughout three scenarios that offer different perspectives on future potential, namely status quo, global common, and compet competing nation. Meanwhile, various applications are operated in three sectors of the maritime technology, which are marine science, naval operation, and survey and exploration. Some problems that have been raised in the report are slowing path of globalization, technological advancement, industrial revolution. Technology is developing very fast, especially in information and communication technology at the core of advanced maritime technology. Autonomous system functionality and technology is the key challenge of maritime advanced technology as indicated by this method. First, how technology is developed, validated, and applied in autonomous system. Second, the challenges related to technology installation and integration with existing assets. Third, the related risk, dependent on the ability or reliability in operation and the overall system security justification. Four, the affordability and whether technology represent an interesting and relevant investment case of infrastructure. The development of advanced maritime technology breakthrough is prioritized in the light of persisting climate change. The use of unmanned systems with high accuracy and efficiency is also prioritized for monitoring and detection of criminal crimes at sea. Awareness and commitment are the indicator of success in law enforcement effort at sea and strengthening maritime resilience. Without having to go through a convoluted process that demand higher level hierarchy, both communication, coordination, and consultation aspect between the fleet and Coast Guard will be much easier. Commitment to maintain the stability of maritime environment security or the quality of maritime security require diplomatic infrastructure management and maritime diplomacy implementation in accelerating marine reconstruction agreement with regional countries. That's all my presentation. Thank you for the attention and I wish you all a good and fruitful conference. Thank you, uh, Admiral Professor Amrullah, for your well-structured presentation. Uh, he emphasized on the environmental security and also the climate security importance uh, with special emphasis to sea uh, pollution and uh, waste management, etc. Right. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move to the last present of this session. Professor Dr. Mohat Mizan bin Mohammed Aslam. He is a professor of defense, security and strategic studies in National Defense University of Malaysia. Professor Dr. Mohammed Aslam is also a senior lecturer in counterterrorism studies at the Naif Arab University for Security Science, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. <coughs> professor 
Mizan also works with Ministry of Home Affairs of Malaysia in developing national actions and modules on de-radicalization programs. Professor Dr. Mohammed Aslam, the floor is yours. Right. <clears throat> um, okay, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much to um, Mr. Chairman uh, for this um, very warm welcome. And I would like to uh, congratulate uh, KDU particularly uh, for this uh, 15th IRC and I am delighted to be one of the um, speaker and um, I'm happy to share uh, my knowledge uh, regarding the, uh, the things that we can do uh, for strategic stability. And I don't want to take a long time because I would like only to throw a main idea of this uh, conference and give you some ideas and uh, to let the, the floor and uh, all of the parties uh, to discuss more uh, on, on the uh, things that I'm going to share. And I would like to uh, thank you also all of my uh, speakers, yeah, uh, the, the clicks uh, who just presented. And it is also a wonderful presentation and give me some of ideas uh, of uh, the issues that we are facing now. Okay, so let me let me uh, share uh, slides, which is uh, not not so long. It is only about uh, seven um, slides uh, to be shared. Okay. Um, so, okay. so good. Um, uh, um, no organizer, can can you let me? You can share your slides, Professor Mishan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, we got it right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> right. So my my presentation today is mostly on the national security through. Uh, strategic stability, yeah? uh, which is um, I'm focusing on the fourth force of um, means uh, strategic uh, stability, which is um, nowadays um, we are not only focusing on um, what we call the traditional uh, kind of um, military uh, advance that we have. Uh, for example, we have a group of um, uh, the, the so-called, the, the first force that we have is um, uh, the military uh, or we call uh, the army itself, right? And then uh, we got the second force, which is um, the air force. And then we got the third one, uh, which is we are focusing on the maritime or we call naval. So, um, on the next one I'm going to share, which is on, on the very urgent need for all of the uh, people around the world, especially we are in the military uh, kind of um, industry related to, uh, which is on the cyber trooper or cyber uh, military, right? And uh, as we know that um, we are not only um, uh, having uh, difficulty uh, as physical that we know uh, we are uh, means uh, fighting physically um, a traditional way of war uh, which is war between countries yeah? uh, using the, the physical um, weapons and so on and so forth however, however now we are also focusing and we are dealing with um, like an invisible kind of enemy which is we, we didn't see them, but they, they come uh, straight to 
to to to our camp to to our machines to to our means uh, home eh? rather than they come directly uh, physically but they they come silently eh? so so my focus for presentation today is on uh, how we strengthen our national security uh, through strategic stability which is we are focusing on a uh, cyber security so uh, that that's the main idea here right so then okay the cyber security so um, we know that um, okay uh, right let, let, me, let me share it again okay yeah okay <clears throat> we know that um, uh, what what they have the meaning of uh, cyber security is a computer security eh? cyber security or information technology security okay um, is the protection of computer systems and networks from information disclosure theft of or damage to their hardware software or electronic data as well as from the disruption of misdirection of the services they provide so what we have to understand here well if we are talking about having a very sophisticated latest technology of military eh? so we no need to mention about uh, having the latest version of missiles or uh, weapons or tank uh, navy system or radar or whatsoever but if we've been hacked by the uh, those who who are so-called this invisible enemy so they will go straight to our system our networks and then all of the machines all of the weapons that we have it is not useful anymore so that's how we should means that we, we should take precautions and we should take uh, the best uh, measure to stop uh, this kind of um, uh, threat right and like i said just now it is related to computer security cyber security information technology that could harm not only our machines but the networks itself yeah? so then if we have any kind of weapons we cannot use it because it was hacked and then it cannot be used anymore and we cannot attack our enemy and um means uh, we, we are on the defensive side and we are totally completely on in a uh, problems and we might have a big difficult and um, issues right okay so that's what what is all about the cyber security okay okay now if we go on the cyber attack right so we we've, we've been attacked like i said at the beginning we are not been attacked physically we are not been attacked um as normal kind of uh, attack but we've been attacked by by the so-called uh, invisible enemy uh, it is also known as a cyber uh, cyber attack uh, so uh, we can see also um, not only um, uh, the, the, the recent war between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, but all around the world uh, actually uh, the, the, the needs to strengthen uh, the cyber security eh? because cyber security actually is a uh, very important because when we have a good in terms of a cyber defense then we can attack from uh, any source of um, um, means uh, invisible enemy otherwise we will be in big trouble eh? so a cyber attack is any offensive maneuver that target computer information system computer networks infrastructure or personal computer devices so um, it means not only computer that we you we do eh, uh, or the system or the network that we do in our camp our military base eh, or our national uh, defense university kdu or whatsoever then they might also uh, intrude or hack our own personal computer that we also use it um, for any kind of uh, works related to our uh, institution right so th this is what i said just now which is we are talking talking about our cyber military which is our fourth um, 
uh, what we call the, the, the fourth force. Eh? So this is the, the normal that we have three and uh, we are always put the cyber uh, like a one department eh? under, under maybe under the armed force eh? or under the military itself. But I, I would like to suggest and with this kind of uh, conference eh? for all of the um, means um, entities eh? around the world those who are involved uh, in the military defense, uh, we should also look into into another fourth force, eh? force we call the force force, which is focusing on cyber military. So it might be uh, someone uh, in a different uniform, eh? uh, but they are also um, part of the very important. And I I might say the cyber military it could be uh, above all of the traditional kind of armed forces that we have. Eh? So they might be the, the highest one because um, what we have here, what we have here and here won't be work anymore if uh, the, the cyber attack happened. So then that's why we have to strengthen uh, this one, right? Okay, so so why we need force force eh? to provide security to all citizens and military, right? Uh, the country itself, eh? our prime minister, our president, eh? and many more. Eh? So you are talking about, for example, Air Force One, uh, who are on the airspace, eh? uh, and then suddenly the, the system has been hacked, and then the, the plane might be uh, grounded, eh? uh, or all of the um, satellites uh, in the outer space might be fall down uh, yeah, once the system has been hacked. So which is uh, to provide a security to all citizens and military so that we need uh, such kind of um, force. Eh? And then detecting, defending, responding and preventing. So this is the four main pillars that I, I would like to suggest here when we talk about cyber security in military, all right, as a strategic tools, we need to ensure um, our, our team, they, they know how to detect the uh, work to defend the system itself and then to respond and finally to prevent. Yeah? Uh, so uh, prevent it from uh, happen again. Yeah? So it may harm military system and networks yeah? uh, and, and many more. Right. So this is like the first, yeah? the first attack that could happen uh, all around the world. Okay. Then when, when, when the war, for example, go for so long, uh, and then when they, they have a time that they have the no more, for example, electricity, eh? uh, no more uh, access uh, to the country, then after that, it will start the physical war. So that's why before before physical war starts um, and the, the fastest attack, the fastest kind of war, which is a cyber war or cyber security attack, right? And then... Um, Right, so we like to for, for for the for my last slide, which is steps um, in building a cybersecurity strategy. Right, so uh, the first one, okay, we have to uh, understand uh, our your your cyber threat uh, landscape. So um, to in order to to uh, to be prepared, actually. Um, when we establish our our so-called cyber military or cyber troopers, eh? so the first one is to understand the cyber threat landscape. Eh? Um, the what what are the objective of those kind of attacks? Um, are they are they want to uh, destroy the military capability or are they want to destroy the um, uh, economy of the country eh? or to create uh, troubles, eh? uh, to create issues eh? uh, such as uh, what had happened recently in, in many countries, eh? including Sri Lanka. So we, we can see when the people um, uh, means have access to the internet, we have access to, to the cell phone, smartphone and uh, lots of information. And even in, in our uh, coming uh, years eh? uh, now, uh, the AI artificial intelligence have been used widely to uh, change uh, even the results of uh, votes. Eh? So uh, for me, the, uh, 
the uh, political system, eh? uh, what we call the democracy political system that we use now, which is really in big trouble when uh, the cyber attacks come and how uh, people's uh, mind have been manipulated by um, untrue and false uh, information news and whatsoever. Right? Second one, uh, the, the team itself have to assess uh, the cyber security capability, what, what we have, what kind of strength that we have. That's why we, we should have our fourth uh, force, uh, which is focusing on this. And then um, it, we, we should also engage with those who are uh, very good, talented eh, in, in doing kind of scam or um, what we call the hackers itself. Eh? Uh, because this these are uh, a cream de la cream. This, this is a very good brain that we should not isolate them. Eh? Uh, that's why in certain countries, for example, we, we do have uh, figures that are very really good in uh, hack the system, then we just ignore them and then they've been employed by another party because they know the capability. So that's why we, we should not uh, means uh, deny uh, of this uh, kind of gifted mind that we should collaborate or we should use uh, for the sake of the country, right? And then the third one, to determine how to eliminate your cyber enemy. So once we already know our capability, we know the, the, the objective of the attack, and then uh, we now come to another part, the, first, the, the, the action is to eliminate. That, that's the, the best part. Uh, whether we are uh, success or not eh? uh, or we are good enough to eliminate or they might transform uh, or they might use like a, the, the bigger scale of attack. Maybe they just try for the beginning and we start to eliminate, uh, start to attack them and then they might come back with a good or big uh, kind of uh, troops that might um, um, disturb any any kind of uh, initiative that we do all right uh, so know how to improve your cyber security this is also like um, the the life uh, long uh, action okay which is we should uh, continuously build our capability build our cyber security train our people eh? uh, give their awareness and many more dr okay. aslam you have one more minute please yeah and understand okay give me one minute all right then you have to document your cyber strategy all right make sure everything is on the uh, document and yet we have to understand when we document it okay if it is still and in in the form of uh, paper okay in the computer it might be hacked again so don't forget to make sure that we have the hard copy and then the last one is train and practice our cyber troopers, actually our military, to know the, the strategy and to, to take advantage and get advanced with uh, those kind of changes in, in the uh, whole of uh, the cyber uh, world, right? So that's it uh, from me, uh, from now, that I would like to uh, discuss. And uh, thank you for your time and uh, opportunity that been given to me, right? And uh, I would like to have a good time for Q&A. Uh, and then uh, if I couldn't answer it, I might, uh, you, you may write an email to me and then uh, I will drop my email and contact number at the chat box and please do in touch, All right? So again, thank you very much, All right? I'll go back to Mr. Chairman, cheers. Dr. Aslam, uh, thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentation. And he mainly focused on the cyber security and the cyber attack. And I'm sure there will be uh, many more questions on these areas, especially on the deep web and the dark web crimes as well. So uh, let me have uh, 20 minutes for Q&A session. And the uh, floor is open to you. Uh, anybody who is uh, willing to uh, post questions on virtual platform may do it so with the chat box, please. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, Dr. Sanan.
both uh, Dr. Ari and Admiral Chauhan. Uh, I understand Admiral Chauhan presented maybe his own interpretation of Indo-Pacific, but I'm a bit confused whether uh, what uh, Dr. Ari presented and Admiral Chauhan presented, uh, I mean, uh, to me, it's geographically also different and conceptually also different. Uh, is there a kind of a uh, overlapping part there? Or, I mean, I'm asking from Dr. Ari, because we follow your uh, Indo-Pacific strategy document. But what uh, Admiral Chauhan presented was a little bit differ, different from that. So if, uh, you know, differences arise in their own interpretations in Indo-Pacific in the future, how you are going to reconcile this? Uh, shall, I, shall I start, Vice Admiral? That's right, you? Yeah, please. Um, I, I would say that there is a very significant overlap. Um, they're not identical um, approaches, but they're very significant overlap. And I think that one might look to the quad, um, which the Vice Admiral referred to too, and to, to sort of flesh out how there's um, some very similar values and interests, but it's not always identical. So the Quad, which was mentioned, um, which includes the United States and India, it's a partnership and it's based on both values and capability. And each Quad member shares a collective commitment to certain values like democracy, peace, security, and prosperity in the region and strives for some similar goals. But that doesn't mean that things will be implemented exactly the same by each. And I would say that's probably um, a good way to think about the different sort of um, maritime uh, strategies and approaches. Over, over to you, Vice Admiral. Thank you very much. I just add uh, a couple of things. One is, no, this is not my interpretation, not my personal interpretation of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is India's formally stated, formally enunciated at the prime ministerial level uh, at the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, if I'm not wrong, uh, by present Prime Minister of India. And therefore, uh, this is an uh, official statement of what is the uh, geographical extent for India of the Indo-Pacific. Now, there are three factors. One, I entirely agree that it is not necessary, and I try to emphasize that in my presentation, it is not necessary for everybody to have an identical construct which is physical in its physical limits, simply because nations are sovereign and sovereign powers may give whatever names and whatever constructs that they desire to their uh, to areas and to concepts and functions within their sovereign jurisdiction. Now, as a sovereign power, we give, we conceive of the Indo-Pacific in its traditional fashion. In the case of the United States of America, they have to contend with the balance between uh, what the United States as a country might feel versus the combatant commands and the seam lines between the combatant commands. So uh, in this area, you've got Central Command, you've got uh, AFRICOM, and you've got the indo uh, pacom and now to, uh, to, to solve this seam area going west of the west coast of India, the United States has, uh, has its own set of uh, challenges. However, that having been said, insofar as the application of activities, which is the point you made, that not only is it uh, different in geography, but it is different in the execution of strategy. For India, the Indo-Pacific per se is not a strategy. For India, the Indo-Pacific is a strategic geography. Inside the geography, India will have many strategies designed to promote what it hopes will be saga. So I don't think that there, and, sec, uh, and, and lastly, I want to uh, reinforce what uh, was just said in that the, you know, um, strategic uh, convergence is far more important uh, and today, there is a considerable evidence of strategic convergence in the Indo-Pacific constructs of not just the USA and India, but the USA, India, Australia, the European Union, and, and, and countries within the European Union, such as uh, France and, and the Netherlands and Germany, 
all of them have the same construct. They say the Indo-Pacific is about, not about India, it is about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And these have traditionally, except for one very small 400 year interregnum called the colonial period, this has been a single strategic space. And if we don't recognize that, then I think that we would do well to perhaps re-look at what is the historical expanse over which we are casting our gaze and based upon which we are arriving at this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Ash. Professor, one minute. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. My question goes to Dr. Hari uh, the I am uh, Akbar Suharshi Fanayandu. As for the, uh, as you ability discuss regarding the, the funding that you have done to Sri Lanka and the uh, countries within the uh, Pacific region. So, it shows the interest the uh, West has on, the, on this region. But as for the record, uh, recorded uh, this thing, Sri Lanka debt is approximately 50 billion. And when you consider the uh, Russia uh, war, now you all have, I think, as for the uh, funding, it has gone more than, some say it is 50, some say it is 80, and some say it is even above 100 billion. So uh, all these nations in the Indo-Pacific, they are developing countries. So they need money to develop their countries. So when, uh, when the, uh, the funds are lacking, they have to go to the other countries in search of funds to develop their own nation. So when they go for other countries, these countries get sandwiched between the power rival uh, between the great powers. So what are what are comment on this? Well, um, I I think the uh, distinction that uh, the Vice Admiral Brody Chahun made between capacity and capability is a, an important one to think about. Um, we sometimes say that you know you can give someone fish that would be on the capacity side, or you can um, give them a fishing pole and maybe some lessons and some bait to fish with so that they um, then will be able to uh, get their own fish. And um, in general, um, the, the US perspective on this is that we want to do all we can to support our partners because a strong partner is a better partner for both for that partner and for their sovereignty, um, but also for us. So we do um, what we can to um, strengthen uh, the capability of um, our partners and allies. Thank you. Yeah, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, relates to the theme of the, uh, the, uh, the session, uh, science technology and uh, sustainability and national security. And specifically, uh, this session uh, uh, related to this session. Now, our defense thinking has been changed because of the fourth industrial revolution. And the disruptive technologies change our defense thinking, therefore, when we talk of strategic sustainability, we have to think of uh, disruptive technologies and its impact of defense, th defense thinking, especially artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence robotics, machine to machine communication, big data, and that type of thing. How can we talk of sustainability of defense thinking without paying attention to uh, new developments, especially relating to uh, elements of fourth industrial revolution that I have mentioned just now. Professor Aslam, uh, would you like to comment on this? <clears throat> Professor Aslam, would you like to uh, comment on this, uh, please? Anybody uh, from here? Yeah. So um, I'm happy to take, um, uh, try to answer, or try to respond to that excellent point. Um, 
So uh, Professor Oslam talked about cyber military and cyber security. And um, I think one might also think of cyber sovereignty moving forward. Um, and by that, I mean that countries need to make sure that your cyber infrastructure is not controlled by another country when you upgrade to 5G and, and other IT infrastructure upgrades. I think often countries see this as primarily an economic or financial decision, maybe by the lowest systems. But we need to think of this more um, as the, with the security components as well. And then um, I would also mention that I was very intrigued by um, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan's um, point that, quote, the next two centuries will be centuries of the sea, end quote. And to get to your uh, question about uh, the accelerating technologies and science um, in the Industrial Revolution, Revolution, it made me wonder, you know, in the next two centuries, what will we mean by the seas? Um, because as, um, as Vice Admiral Octavian reminded us, climate change and environmental issues are going to dramatically affect the seas. They'll be rising, they'll be warmer, there'll be a lot more extreme weather events in the seas. And perhaps even more significantly, our technology is going to change so fast. Um, but if we look back 200 years, in 1820, steam engines had just first been used for only about a decade for ships. It took about 100 years before then steam replaced sailing ships. And then quickly we transitioned to coal, and then more quickly to petrol, and then more quickly to nuclear. So um, I think this, this idea of innovation, you know, our, our keynote speaker talked about the importance of innovation um, for your GDP, right? You need to have above 55% of your GDP be uh, based on innovation for, to have um, good steady rises. But as a security matter, innovation is going to be critical, especially you know, looking out over the audience, there's all these young um, people here, and, and they're going to see big changes in their lives. So I would just sort of suggest that maybe the seas in the next two centuries that they're, we're going to be looking at won't necessarily just, the, what we'll think of the seas on Earth will be different. It's going to change our notion of the seas. It may involve sea beds uh, as well. But the seas more generally could involve the seas of Jupiter's moon and Europa, which have more ocean than we do, or the seas of Saturn's moon in, um, in Celadus, which scientists think there might be life on. So our conception of what the seas is over the next 200 years, given the, um, the rapidly accelerating changes in science and technology, the innovations we're seeing, is going to, I think, be quite different than it is now. Thank you. Uh, Admiral uh, Chawan, would you like to uh, make a comment on the disruptive technologies? What do you... yeah. Yes, thank you. There are two or three points I want to make very quickly. Uh, it's an excellent question. The first is that we are not particularly clear in my thinking about what we mean when we use the word science. We tend to concentrate upon STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and forget that the social sciences and the life sciences need to inform us as defense personnel, as security uh, uh, planners, equally. For example, uh, any, any government can tell its people, build a port in so-and-so location. But no government can tell trade, come to the port that I built. And therefore, if India, for example, was to decide to build a port in location X, you have to, and location X was in an island territory, you have to think about where will, where will the skinware come from? Where will the human beings come from? And they, therefore, uh, will come from the mainland, then what will be the social, cultural impact of large numbers of people moving from one to the other. Who is informing us about all this? Nobody. Because we, in our obsession to harness the advantages of STEM, have forgotten the necessity to be informed by the economics, by, by, the, by the science of economics, by the science of the human, by the science of, uh, of uh, uh, the life sciences. And that's how we land up in this whole business of uh, climate change and, and the difficulties of actually moving to a blue economy. That is point number one. Point number two is with regard to, uh, with regard to the uh, absorption of the technologies involved in Industry 4.0 or 4.0. Most certainly, it is an extremely relevant point. We are now looking to skill our people. And we are looking to skill them so that we can have port 4.0, so that we can have shipping 4.0. But what skills are we imparting? And who is doing the activity of identifying the skills that will be required in numbers? 
plus the reskilling of the people that you will be replacing on account of additive manufacturing, on account of, uh, of uh, all the nine or 11 pillars, depending on whose uh, concept you take, which are involved in industry 4.0. So is there a defense 4.0? Most certainly. Are we progressing along that? But of course, now, insofar as technology is concerned, technology is neither productive nor destructive. Technology is technology. And now what you decide to do with that technology will make it either destructive or productive. And that, I think, is a, is a, is a higher level of discussion. And that is exactly where senior leadership of all countries, not merely those of, but most certainly that of the Indian Ocean countries as well, needs to rise to. You need to be able to rise to this level and say, right, these technologies are required. These technologies are likely to have this impact. And when, when uh, Ari talks about, uh, Jason talks about the uh, change of the seas, I couldn't agree more. But is, is, is seabed uh, uh, an area that we ought to uh, involve ourselves in deeply right now? Are we reaching a state where we will be um, fools rushing in, where angels fear to tread? Should we be looking at this? Where are the studies on all this? And therefore, all these studies are what we look to universities such as KDU for. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, yeah. Any right. more questions? Okay. Let me add. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. Um, so, I would like to add what been uh, told by uh, Mr. Ari and Prof. Chauhan. So, I agree with um, both. But I would like to add at least a few things here for us to, to understand when we talk about uh, the cyber security, the cyber attacks, as well as the needs of the uh, science and technology in, in the whole world, right? So like, like Prof. Chauhan said just now, we are living, okay, actually we are talking about 4.0, but in certain extent, um, some scholars also mentioned that we already embarked to 5.0 especially when we are dealing with uh, cyber war, uh, cyber terrorism, uh, and uh, we got also this pandemic uh, that, that have been used as part of the uh, war also, right? So, okay, we put it one side, but what, uh, another thing that we, we should understand um, how uh, the use of this science and technology also um, change uh, the way that we we use for for the conventional war, right? And for for example, uh, we can see when when the uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine happened, uh, and the, the media also not only uh, we know that we we do have a cyber or media war, right? Uh, so media warfare, and then how certain kind of uh, issues have been used uh, to to manipulate those kind of system. But what we would like to understand here, how science and technology also taking part when they use AI to, to change the video, to change the, uh, the voice, eh? uh, to alter the news, the, the message, the information. And finally, the end users, which is people, uh, they got confused and they don't know which one are right and which one are true. Okay, that's the first issue that we should understand. And uh, like I said in my presentation just now, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. One of the uh, system that really have a big challenge, yeah? challenge to, to this kind of uh, changes, which is a democratic uh, kind of government, uh, because we are leaving to the people, to the system, the, especially when we use the capitalist uh, economic system, which is impacted very uh, big on this kind of issue. Okay, the thank you. One, thank you, Dr. Aslam. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, also we yeah, will have uh, one more question uh, since the time is limited. Uh, Doctor? The, the AI to change understanding of people on uh, science and technology and the, the younger generation don't like to, to use this kind of thing anymore. So they're focusing on, um, for example, use Uber uh, or the food uh, delivery uh, or the uh, also kind of thing rather than focusing on science and technology. And the last part, which is very important to focus, is on the ownership of all those kind of technology that have been used. Okay, we, we should not, uh, as Ari said, 
give it to another contractor and finally we have no ownership so then it could be transferred and it could sell all of the uh, very important information. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Aslam. Okay. Uh, one more from the audience and we'll go to the chat box. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, this question is uh, to Dr. Nathan. Um, in line with the theme, we are, talk we are talking of uh, national security, economic, uh, energy security, economic security. At the end of the day, the key topic would be innovation. Well, you clearly highlighted the difference between the capacity and the capability. Countries like Sri Lanka in the region, should we follow the conventional route of the developing the the uh, capabilities by the, the sample of the uh, fish rod or isn't there any other mechanism, alternative mechanism where the capacity building can be assisted by way of providing uh, assistance to develop the national ecosystem rather than going through the conventional way of trying to evolve by themselves this capacity and uh, the capability rather. Is there any other alternative mechanism from countries like the US in this regard? Um, well, let me emphasize that US assistance, it, it, it varies um, significantly what we do, but we do tend to focus on technical assistance to build capability of our allies and partners. Um, that's, that's where we tend to put most of our um, resources to, to, to build um, and work with other countries. Um, but I think your question also goes to the issue of um, development strategies, um, which have changed over, over the last century and in the last few decades. And now there, there, is, there are opportunities for countries to sort of do leapfrogging, right, in, in their um, development, um, to not have to go through every stage that maybe countries had to go through in development um, in the past. Um, and so I think Sri Lanka is probably well positioned um, to do that. And um, you know, Sri Lanka with its extremely entrepreneurial and innovative uh, col uh, entrepreneurial culture, um, I think will be able to um, take advantage of um, those opportunities to leapfrog developmentally. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's take a question from the chat box. It goes to uh, Dr. Arinathan. How do you assess U.S. presence in the Indian Ocean as a competitor or a cooperative member? And also there is another portion, perception of the Asian century. Uh, it's, what is your perception of the Asian century? Well, um, so the, the uh, point was made by the Vice Admiral that the next two centuries will be centuries of the sea, right? And um, when I talked about the Indo-Pacific strategy, um, the U.S. perspective is that the Indo-Pacific is really going to be um, at the heart of the future. So I might frame it that way, um, I think, would, would be a good way to frame that. Um, and then um, as far as the U.S. Uh, presence, uh, uh, our perspective is that um, our best advantage that we have, um, our greatest strength, is our partnerships and our alliances. You know, that's why we work with countries. We, 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 we have um, cooperation across the board, whether it's the private sector, um, academia, government, mill-to-mill uh, -mill cooperation, um, because, as I said before, we want to build the capability of our, our friends, um, because when your friends and your allies are stronger, then you all can accomplish more together. So that is, that is our perspective on how we um, operate um, in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Hari. Uh, we'll have one more question. Uh, uh, it goes to uh, Admiral Chauhan. What are the possible cooperation as per your opinion, both India and China in the Indian Ocean region? 
Rather than oh, seeing as be... a uh, rival. Yeah. Yeah. That's easy. Uh, everybody knows the issue of rivalry and, and competition. Cooperation is an essential uh, uh, pathway down which we must uh, tread, upon which we must tread. And I think that the correct approaches would be that, you know, you cannot do anything about global climate without involving China. You can't just do it. And you can't do anything about a global climate in the global south um, climate change in the global south and the blue economy without involving India. And therefore, India and China are natural partners in this regard. Does it mean that India and China, you know, there's an old saying, sir, that once you open a can of worms, the only way to put them back is to use a bigger can. And therefore, when we have got a can of worms that has been opened up by the rivalries of the 21st century, between India and China, the only way to handle this is to find a bigger paradigm, a bigger can. There are two approaches to that. One, as I said, work on planetary threats. Climate change, the blue economy, these are planetary issues. Work on India and China have huge areas to cooperate here. Not even going to the literal meaning of moving into a planetary defense and planetary security, which would involve outer space and stuff like that, but might end up in another area of competition. But how to save the planet we have? These are areas that we must be able to involve India and China cooperatively in, and I think that there's huge scope for it at the, at the sub-tactical level. At the other end of the spectrum lies the whole area of uh, search and rescue and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Another area in which there is much scope for cooperative endeavor. Uh, I think that even if we were to tap into the, the either end of the spectrum, uh, there would be areas of cooperation and not necessarily would we be limited to areas of, uh, of rivalries. Having said that, there is one caveat, of course. Why we discuss issues uh, in, a, in an academic environment, it is one thing. Once we start to affect uh, one another's sovereignty to a point where armed conflict is breaking out, then there's another thing. And we need to resolve that first because that is uh, a necessary um, precondition to being able to work cooperatively anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Chauhan. Uh, this concludes the first session of the uh, conference of IRC uh, on the theme of national security through strategic stability. And uh, I think we have amply uh, highlighted the importance of sustainable national security through the common values and understanding the challenges uh, among the nations and how best we could uh, overcome these uh, complex situations. Uh, once again, I must thank Dr. Ari Nathan, Admiral Chauhan, Professor Amrullah and Dr. Aslam for taking their time to make their presentations and also the audience and the people who have joined us virtually. And I must thank the Vice Chancellor KDU and General Meeting the Piris for making this event a success. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That was a very interesting and lively discussion. And I believe we will all leave this auditorium with much food for thought. I'd like to once again thank the chairperson, Major General Amal Karna Sekara, for gracing the 15th International Research Conference with his presence amidst his busy schedule. I'd also like to thank the distinguished speakers of the first plenary for defense and strategic studies. Dr. Ari Nathan, Vice Admiral, retired, Pradeep Chauhan, ABSM and Ba VSM, Vice Admiral, TNI, Professor, Dr. IR, Amarullah Octavian, MSc, DEST, ASEAN Engineer, Professor, Dr. Mohod Mizan bin Mohammed Aslam for sharing their thoughts on the theme, National Security through Strategic Stability. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite Major General Melinda Pires, the Vice Chancellor of General Sir John Kutulawi Defence University, 
accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Bharata Jaivira, the adjutant of KDU, to present the token of appreciation to Major General Amal Karuna Shekhar, the plenary chair of session one. Sir, please remain on stage. Now I would like to invite Dr. Ari Nathan to receive the token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, with that we conclude the first plenary for Defense and Strategic Studies for the 15th International Research Conference. I request the online participants to remain with us via the link provided for the second plenary session. The participants who are with us today physically may join us at the auditorium of Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies at 2 p.m. Thank you. Recording stopped.